Hafa Day and welcome to the University of Guam's, Guam Press's Creative Conversation. Guahusi Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero and I'm the managing editor of the University of Guam Press. Uh, for those of you who uh, may not know much about the press, I'm going to share our mission. Uh, the University of Guam Press advances regional scholarship, develops cultural literacy, and expands accessibility to knowledge about Micronesia by providing high quality peer reviewed publishing services. Uh, UOG Press has a one wonderful collection of local local literature, children's books, and academic publications, which can all be found on our website at uog.edu backslash uog press. Uh, all of our publications are also available at uh, local bookstores and uh, the Triton uh, bookstore, both online and at the University of Guam campus and on Amazon. Uh, before we begin today, I'd like to share some exciting announcements of upcoming events. Uh, University of Guam Press will be co-hosting with the UOG Depart Division of English and Applied Linguistics the launch of the 19th issue of Storyboard, a journal of Pacific imagery with the theme Oceania Rising this coming Thursday, December 17th at 12 noon live right here on UOG Press's Facebook page. Um, and, and just a, a little side note, uh, this issue of Storyboard features many wonderful uh, pieces of art from our presenter today. So that's a, a nice little uh, thing to look forward to. Uh, after the launch, Storyboard will be available for sale at the UOG Triton Bookstore and at our offices on the second floor of the Micronesian Area Research Center from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. For more information about where to pr purchase Storyboard and any of our other publications, please call 735-2154 or email uogpress at gmail.com. For writers who are looking for an opportunity to get away and focus on their writing for large blocks of uninterrupted time, we are accepting applications for a writing retreat that will take place at the Mariso Seaside Airbnb in February of next year. This is a wonderful opportunity for writers hoping to finalize a book project for publication. The deadline to apply is January 15, 2021, and the application can be found on the projects page of our website at uog.edu backslash uog press. Without further ado, let's jump right into our creative conversation. Uh, our creative conversation series is made possible with generous support from the Guam Ad Economic Development Authority, or GIDA, um, who has supported our larger Menyetluni Mentitigi Writers Fellowship. Menyetluni Mentitigi roughly translates into siblings who write. The fellowship includes a variety of activities intended to support our Menyetlu through the writing process, including peer review writing workshops and presentations and discussions with acclaimed authors and artists from our, com our community through this Creative Conversation series. The goal of Creative Conversations is to connect authors and artists and create a space for them to inspire and learn from each other. Um, I'd like to introduce our Menyetlu Ni Mentitigi Fellowship Director, Akina Chargalov, who will introduce our presenter for today. Today's creative conversation. Hoffa day and welcome, Akina. Hoffa day, Lola. Thank you. And Hoffa day, everyone who is joining us right now. So today we are honored to be joined by Indigenous artist and visual storyteller Joseph Certeza. Joy's illustration depicting the coconut tree legend appeared in an award winning publication, Chamar Legends A Gathering of Stories. The legend tells the story of a brother and sister who had taken care of an elderly woman, and before her death, she gifted them with a seed that became the tree of life, the Chunkaniza. Certeza's illustration of the legend and many of his other works are inspired by his grandmother, Josefa Tampa Cruz Certeza, who dedicated most of her life to healing her people as a Zoomti and Kakana. Certeza is also the co-owner and artist of Child Pacific Designs and a board member of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency. Today, he'll be sharing experiences as a visual storyteller and how we can continue to honor elder story through artistic mediums. So first and foremost, he's Zeus Mahasi Joy for being here. And if you'd like to open with a couple of words. Zeus Mahasi, um, thank you very much, EOG Press, uh, for allowing me to be in this space with you all. And thank you, fellows, that uh, I'm able to share stories with you guys today. Um, it is an honor. Um, and it's an honor that I get to really talk about a lot of the, what my, my work really represents to me as an artist. And, and just as a quick preface, a lot of the things that my artwork really speaks about is really around the culture. And most of that is rooted um, 
within uh, this one woman who in my life was, which is my grandmother, that was uh, that Kina just spoke about. And uh, let's just start off by do a little quick sharing of the screen. And just real quick, can you guys see the image that's popping up? Just a thumbs up can work out for me. Cool beans. Um, so yeah, uh, the reason why I consider myself as a cultural um, practitioner, or cultural artisan, um, it's mostly because of the, the the woman that you see, who is Josefa Tampai Sotela. Um, this is about a four hour art piece I did while I was substituting um, at Southern High School for Vince Regis's um, culture class. And I was just showing kids like, you know, what we can do as artisans, as visual storytellers. And I kind of just like did that little bit here and there. Then during the break time, ready for the next class, I was able to finish it by the time the next class was able to come in. So yeah, it's because of this lady and what she has represented to me in our culture that I also perpetuate our, our people's spirit and our island's identity uh, in my artwork. And that's actually what has translated to um, this next piece today that you guys are now seeing which is what was featured in um, the award-winning Tomorrow Legends book that our amazing Yoji Press has, was able to complete and produce and now has been a staple thing in, in every um, Tomorrow um, household, I think. But yeah, the lady that you see here is just, is my Nana. And in reflection to the piece that was provided by Terry Perez and reading over it, it really spoke a lot about um, our elders in the process or like just about how much these two young kids was able to um, support and take care of of this elderly woman who was ne not necessarily their 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 um, their relative but just the fact that there's it, it's an elder you know and the value of that and for me in my relationship to my grandmother Josefa like she had dementia from 93 to 100 and there'd be periods of time where I got to uh, sleep with her and be with her and, you know, and understand and accept her, her, her stage of life during that period, which was um, undergoing dementia. And that in of itself has, is a lot of experiences that in any, when we take care of our, our, our elders, you know, and they've had, have the dementia there's so much struggle that goes on in that relationship but the outcome when you experience it all and after they move on it's so much more rewarding because you have a deeper respect you have a deeper understanding when it comes to a, another person's elder um, it's and, it on the screen it's only oh. showing very small thumbnails would it be possible oh. to just expand each image again for the the viewers yes yes that's sorry i'm very sorry about that folks i wish maybe uh if anything like this happens for the uh for the future maybe you could also throw it out in the comment area i think that well i i can be able to work with that to make things um uh, um uh, accessible so yeah this is the image that was in in the in the piece, and I was just talking about um, uh, why I chose my nana, why I have such a deep relationship to her, and um, why I have such a deep relation to, to her, and the kind of experiences that allowed me to have that um, connection. Um, so yeah, other than that, just to um, let me see, can I bounce back to another image? But I have more things to share and I think your questions will allow me to um, expand on the different art pieces I have. I have art pieces like what's right behind me, which my artwork took it into a pattern storytelling format. Um, then I have other signers that I've, I've depicted in other art pieces that, uh, you know, if your questions allow me to go to those pieces, by all means, I'll totally expand on different ways of how I honor my elders in my art. But yeah, let's go to the Q&A. Eva, Sinema Asi, Joey. Um, so these 
these events are really meant to be exactly what they're called creative conversations and so we're very excited uh, to be joined today by um, some of our fellows in the Manyatluni Mentitigi uh, Writers Fellowship. Uh, join, joining us today is Edward Faji Jr., Joseph Titano, Kisa Suiku, and Leslie Travis. And we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with our first question from, from Edward. Edward Akbaji Jr. is a UOG student who is working towards his bachelor's in English with a minor in writing and Chamorro studies. Hafade and welcome, Eddie. Buenas and Hafade. I want to first uh, thank uh, Mr. Certeza for your time today. Um, my first question um, is how does art in the form of visual storytelling differ, differ to the experience of other art forms like music or literature? Oh, that's a really good question. So as a visual storyteller, telling stories through my illustrations versus telling stories through music, and how does that differentiate, right? That's the question, cool beans. Um, I just wanna make sure I get that question in my mind. Um, I just, I guess it's more so the vehicle of how you wanna tell your story, you know? As a visual storyteller, we tell it through imagery, how we um, paint strokes, the symbolisms that you see in, um, what is visually displayed in a composition of an artwork versus when we think about music, it's more so symbolisms in, in, in a rhythm and how the, the, the atmosphere created by music um, channels a feeling. And that feeling in music kind of translates to an experience and you can become nostalgic if it connects to an individual. So in a way, how it differentiates, music has more of a, a, a play with sound and a relationship with sound and words. Whereas in visual, you just get what you see. And how does that connect to you when you interpret another person's artwork versus how an artist interprets their own? You know, that has power in it itself. And then when you as a writer, you know, you get to use really, you get to play more off with, um, with words actually. And how do these words give us uh, a sense of space? How do words give us a sense of nostalgia, of experience with our elders? And I think that's like the most beautiful part as a, as a writer, you know? You get to give us that imagery through your words and being poetic, being mindful of your words, I think that has power and weight. And I love seeing that in the next generation. And, I think that's what inspires me to continue doing my stuff because it's like a push. It's like a, you're doing such good stuff. Okay, let me continue doing good stuff so you can maintain your good, your good energy. So yeah, thank you for that question. I really appreciate that. All right, thank you, Joey. All right, so up next we have Joseph Titano, senior at UOG and inspiring author. Hey, yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing your work, man. Really cool. Uh, I'm I'm a little curious. Um, you work in seem you work in some different mediums, whether it's the designs, the patterns, or uh, some you know the drawings that you just uh, the paintings that you just showed us of your grandmother. I'm curious when you get an idea for something like how does how do you when you have an idea for a piece how does that begin like where does it start Do you have an image in your head Do you have like a thought or a feeling or is it with a memory of a specific instance or something You know. How does that process kind of start for you? And oh. how does you, how do you carry that through to the end? Oh man, uh, dude, I really appreciate that question. Like, what is that spark in me to con from, from beginning to end? And what is that, what is that, what is that mindset that, what is that, oh yeah, that's tough, you know? Like, cause I get so bombarded with all these amazing ideas. Cause a lot of my, my sparks comes from conversation with friends. And being able to have that kind of vibe, like, ooh, our minds are like totally exploding with one another. And um, a lot of my ideas come from my conversations and just being inspired from my conversations, actually. Um, yeah. Okay. So quickly, let's say, man, sweet. Okay. Um, what you guys see in my background uh, is. Wait, where's my zoom action? I want, I need this exploded actually. Um, right behind me actually, this piece, I'm gonna slide to the side so you can see more of it. Um, one way how I have able to channel 
a, 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 an idea and complete it to a finished piece was that when one of my elders passed away um, by the name of um, Sina Ed Benaventi, um, when he passed away, I felt compelled to do something about it and honor him and pay respect to what he has given to me as uh, an aspiring practitioner, as someone a part of this uh, independence movement. And for me as an artist, I've always saw my, my activism as an, a form of, of, to use my art, and art as a, as a form of empowering and making people feel pride in something. And when Sana Ed passed away, I'm like, dude, I gotta do something to honor him. I want to. So I spent about maybe 12 hours cutting a stencil for this image right behind me. And that whole time period of cutting that stencil was a moment of reflection about what he has done to me. And that kind of translated into the patterns you see. Sina Ed for me was a mentor. So that's why I have dolphin symbolisms in this piece because he was, um, the dolphins for me symbolizes, it was really rooted in navigation understanding. But in my pattern work, I kind of translated it into a format where um, navigation is also a, a form of mentoring someone too, like being an educator, um, being someone to inspire that person to do better for themselves. And that's why I chose the dolphins. And in between is another zigzag line, which is me acknowledging my pathway. And when we sell in a canoe, we go from side to side. We don't go in a straight line, we go side to side. And that kind of identifies um, in a lot, in what we're doing in the day-to-day -day life, when we have a goal in mind, we don't know exactly where we're going to get there. We just know we wanna get there. So it's like understanding it from left to right, like, okay, dabbling here, dabbling there, just to get to the end point, right? So then translating to the symbols right behind me, right here, I'm pointing to, uh, Silent Ed was really huge in community building, built, creating um, really amazing um, relationships amongst individuals, creating uh, relationships amongst artisans. He was a teacher at Simon, uh, Jeff Donna Kennedy. So inspiring people of the language, and that's the nets and the, the net and the guapa pattern are here is the symbolism of bridging people, weaving people together and their experiences together. And in the middle is a, is another symbol of my of, of, of what I call Ubatao, which is people who bear the burdens of each other in a community. So yeah, ha, <laughs> that is one example of how I take a spark. What is my creative process? What goes into the process? What are the intentions in that process? And how does it look at the very end? And this is the piece. And they were able to use it as um, their wraps during the funeral service of Sina Ed. And there was one thing I added on only the immediate family of Sina Ed was my kind of indicator and acknowledgement to those who are of his blood, of his canoe. So that's taking it to a deeper uh, form of storytelling for an elder. And that's how I wanted to pay respect and honor to him. So yeah, thank you for that question. That was really like, you got me good, dude. <laughs> Thanks for the explanation. That's very cool. That's that's pretty awesome, man. Yeah. Huh. Viva. I like how the use of a stencil too allows the story to keep being told in new places. I think that's really awesome. Um, okay, next up we have um Leslie Travis. Leslie is an attorney. Oh, something just got in my eye. I apologize. Leslie is an attorney who hopes to someday write gentle and beautiful things. Half a day and welcome, Leslie. Thank you so much for um, for sharing your process with us. I think it's it's really inspiring. Um, and you know, as someone who has absolutely uh, like zero, <laughs> I think creative. Uh, um, ability at you know forming anything with my hands like it's so um 
it's it almost makes me want to try stuff almost um but um I, I did have a question though you know as as a writer um i i'm i've been working on some works of fiction and i can kind of uh and and even the stuff that i like to read i i can trace the you know kind of the character arcs of, of some of my favorite characters and and i was wondering you know as a visual artist um especially with your grandmother as your muse if you if you can kind of trace your grandma's influence um like the arc of your grandma's character, if you will, in your creative pieces. <laughs> like, I, I imagine she weaves herself in and out of some of the pieces that aren't even about her. But I think if, um, I wonder if, if you sat down and kind of reflected on your body of work, of course, with the ones, you know, where she's a direct subject, but also even in the ones that, um, in which she's not, if there's a character arc of your grandma in your visual art. Well, that's really cool. I, I never, thought of getting a question like that. And yeah, it is true um, that my grandmother would be someone that would be seen as an influence on a lot of elder, uh, a lot of the elders I depict. You get a glimpse of that wrinkle that's her wrinkles. You get the glimpse of like her eyelids, like that's her. Um, I'm gonna quickly see if I had this one piece, it was, available to me I was thinking about it that's why I was asking Lola if it was okay well, it was okay for me to share a piece where you know it had women's um breast exposed because I think based off your question Leslie I gotta say that's probably the piece that can visually see like a little piece of my grandmother in all of the elders depicted in that one piece and Truthfully, this wasn't an actual, um, uh, a full-on art piece. This was just a random doodle or a sketch that I had in my notebook. Oh man, I see, I knew I should have just saved it because, like, oh man. But um, yes, Leslie, a lot of my pieces, my grandma's signature is there. Another form of signature that is my grandma in my artwork is, all the patterns I do, all of my, um, what folks can say is tribal patterns, they all have a glimpse of my, my grandmother. It's because her being a Zoamti is the reason why I'm in, why I'm doing cultural art, why my artwork always talks about our identity, our spirit, our ancestors. Um, to, yeah, that's, yeah, my signature is, my yeah every all my patterns to me is my grandmother's signature too because um yeah i really want to showcase this piece but i really can't find it i'm like so like looking for it like urgently because i oh there it is okay um uh, i'm gonna bring this up i'm gonna share this on zoom now now that it's shared can yeah so I don't, wait, yeah, sweet. Is it a bigger screen now for you guys? Or is it still small? Okay, cool. Um, so for me, this is when I, a lot of my artwork is very matrilineal. A lot of the pieces that I love to do is always, um, is always about uh, our matrilineal society, our, our women. And one way I always see my grandmas, thank you, Leslie, again, is like, uh, if you're looking at the woman whose faces are kind of like um, one behind the other, I would say like the eyes to me are like something that I, I kind of say is my grandmother that knows how it just curls around the cheek to me. Like I can say that's my grandmother. Then of course, the evolution of hair. My grandma had um, long hair when she was young, then she was perming it as she got older. Um, but yeah, I was just going off with different emotions that I've, yeah. So yeah, that's one example of seeing women, uh, my grandmother in different pieces, but one right here, one I'm currently working on with both of my grandmothers together. Um, yeah. Thank Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, 
So in, in that piece with uh, the kind of your doodle with all the women, <clears throat> yeah. was that, were you intentionally trying to draw your grandma or is that just where your, where your pencil went? Yeah. It's naturally, it's natural that my elders, my older women tend to look like my grandmother. So yeah, you got that more spe specific. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. <clears throat> Thank you, Leslie. All right, so next we have Ki Susuiko. Ki Susuiko is an indigenous digital artist who is the co-chair of Independent Guahan's Art Reach Committee. Off the day of, um, thanks, Joey, for sharing your artwork. Um, Man, I've been a fan of your stuff for a long time now. And uh, as a fellow artist, man, I just want to know, like, culture is not stagnant, right? It's always changing. And art, the kind of art we do, I think kind of helps people re-envision our past and kind of um, allows us to help envision the future as well. So my question is, like, what does the future of cultural art look like to you? And by that, I mean like um, what mediums do you see it using? What kind of imagery? Where do you see it being displayed, being used? Wow, that's a, that's a big question, Key. Sign them off to each other. Um, Key, first of all, I my artwork, is like you pushed me to go that far, FYI too. So gotta just lay that out too. Your work always inspires me to continue to do the work I do. And you know, it's that positive reinforcement that needed more so than um, that competition or my work is better than your work, la di da la di di da la di day kind of deal. But yeah. Um, so the question is the future of art of our cultural arts. Where is it going in what art forms? Um, yeah, damn. Um, that's a pretty heavy question. And in my perspective, um, I see our cultural art expanding and taking ownership in their perspective of all the art forms that the world has to offer. And it's all about how our, our next generation's creatives is able to feel empowered to say, I love this art form, but I also want to um, bring it back home and create some kind of perspective of what home is to me. And I think that's valid and that's valuable. And in terms of what in traditional art forms as well, you know, I think when we look at time and in generations, what is the common art form today could be a traditional art form of tomorrow as well, or be considered a traditional art form, which is why blacksmithing was once a new art form at one point of time, but then today we consider a traditional art form, which is the whole evolution of art to me. Um, I really am so excited to see what the next generation has to offer. I don't want to speculate nor predict, but just anticipate with excitement of what that could, of the mystery actually, like knowing what C. Joseph Tyson is going to do, what Edward Afwadi is going to do. I'm interested already. I, I don't know what their work is. And, but the fact that they're in this circle of, uh, of amazing creatives such as yourself, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm interested because that something beautiful is going to happen from that relationship. And um, I think in terms of holding down the fort also in that aspect of trying to stay true in terms of like protocols and um, trying to keep a certain kind of framework, which is okay in my book of what is cultural art. Um, I think there's a lot of validity in, um, oh man, this is so crazy because it's interesting because in Hawaii, there's a lot of folks who are not of the Hawaiian uh, bloodline, but they're being considered as a kumuhula 
of high regard. So I think our cultural art on Guam might see those kind of people um, come up in the field, which is a great example is Judy Flores. So I think that's also a positive thing, but we also have to be mindful as artisans that you know there's a responsibility that we do as cultural artisans, whether if we are of the culture or of, of the same solidarity of the culture that they're depicting. Um, I say in the same solidarity because, you know, I don't want folks to take advantage of perpetuating our, our, our identity here on Guam. I can, I know some artists are doing that. They're taking advantage of Guam art and using it to their advantage when they sell their art. But there's no kind of respect or give back to our people or to, or to our process, you know. Um, yeah, it's a really deep way to question. I think in moving forward, I think it's all about experiencing it and um, being being really critical with one another in a really amazing, respectful space. Yeah. Wait, can I ask you a follow-up question? Yeah, let's do it. Sorry, <laughs> ladies. <laughs> you brought up how some people are capitalizing on like tomorrow iconography, right? For yeah. For, um, does cultural appropriation water down the value of the artwork that what, what people see as our cultural artwork? Do you think? Does cultural appropriation water down their artwork? Well, no, does cultural appropriation water down what people think of as our cultural artwork? Does it devalue it in any way, do you think? Um, I don't think so, actually. Like, in what, and why I say I don't think so is because if our people, I think we just have to know who, who's creating it. I think that's one. And knowing who they are. And that kind of dictates, dictates the value of what they create in my, in my book. And as long as we, the people, are always acknowledging who we believe is, you know, respected and should be of greater value, um, I think that's one way, one positive way we can um, stay true, stay on a good pathway. We got, as artisans, we got to hold each other accountable. And as artisans, we got to support those who we feel is who should be respected. Like I can say in the carving world, because uh, you know, I'm also a board member at Kaha, so I'm always on on my toes about looking at a lot uh, on the artwork as a whole, who's doing what, with what intentions, and how do I see the value of the artwork. Um, and yeah, there's some people I would like to hold at a higher regard versus other people at a lower regard. But that's my perspective, and that's how I am processing things as an individual, as an art lover as well. So, man, you got me. So, and you know, people can totally take my words out of context, but by all means, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, this is a critical, uh, yeah, a really big question. <laughs> No, man, I mean, you know, as a, as a cultural practitioner, you're, it's, it's, I always want to see our, 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 our artwork, our culture, you know, being authentic and, and being real and, and being ours. Yeah, so yeah, I, I think that's, I do appreciate your comments. I think also one of the biggest things that those of the outside of the community, they always have to acknowledge that they're of the outside and their intentions of wanting to support um, our, our, our stories, you know? I think acknowledging that, and in one way I experienced that recently is that um, for the University of Guam, um, the class department, the school, the College of, of Social Science, yes, the class, I was a moderator for an indigenous film discussion and one of the moderators was of the outside who was um, from America, 
but being a prominent storyteller through film for the Marshall Islands. And I acknowledge what does it feel like uh, being a storyteller, telling indigenous stories, ancient stories, and you're on the outside, you know, what does that role look like to you? What does that responsibility look like to you? And right off the bat, he said, I don't feel like I'm on the outside because um, I spent the time and all that stuff. And that's, you know, that's weight, you know, that's value. Um, creating the sense of worth uh, if, if you're the, of the outside um, trying to be a part of a community is, is a value, I think, you know. Um, you know, there comes to a point where there's an acceptance. And I think that's, that's, that holds power, that holds more weight for the movement, I think. Um, but, you know, they have to acknowledge, yeah. But yeah, that's just getting really technical. Sorry, Key, but thank you for your question. <laughs> Oh, thanks, John. I mean, to put you on the spot, right? No, you're good. It's called a creative conversation for a reason. <laughs> Eva, and we, uh, we're going to go to our last fellow that joined us, and then uh, Akina and I will ask questions, and then we'll restart the question asking cycle. So, uh, Johanna Salinas has just joined us. Uh, Johanna, uh, let's see. Johanna is a poetry lover and works at Guam Department of Education. Hafidey and welcome, Johanna. Do you have a question for Joey? Hafidey, hello everyone. Hi, Joey. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me in. So yes, uh, my question is, um, if you know, knew when you were younger that a pandemic was gonna happen as a young adult, uh, would you have still considered doing art or something creative for your business or, or for your uh, livelihood? Or would you have chosen something more technical, something more practical? Uh, so if as a kid, if I was a kid again, if I knew that there was a pandemic coming in the near future, would I still be a creative? Hmm. Truthfully, I think I would act. I, I, as a kid, I've always was drawing. I was always wanting to create things. Um, in terms of technical stuff, yeah, I don't think I would have. Maybe, but you don't know. Maybe, maybe. But I've always been a creative, and I've always liked to create things as a kid. Um, so I started drawing at the age of five. And from there, I just kept drawing a lot when I was in elementary was part of like some poetry books that the elementary was able to publish. So that was like my kind of my boost. Um, but yeah, it's a good question, Johanna, but I think I'm going to still say I, I would be a creative. Um, would I be doing the art that I'm doing today? Who knows? I don't know. But I, yeah, I know I would be doing something with my hands. Eva, um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask my question and then Akina will and then we'll restart again. So um, I kind of I really liked the conversation you were having with Key about um, just authenticity and intention. I think intention is always one of the most important things to keep in mind as an artist, whether it be through visual arts or writing, right? Always yeah. being clear about our intentions. Um, and I know that it's a process, right? It's something we learned over time. Um, and, and in terms of authenticity, I know for us writers, right, when we're depicting, especially stories set in our place in, in different moments in history, um, we have to do our research, right? We have to, we have even in writing fiction, um, we have to try to capture things um, in a way that does service to the story and to our people, right? Because that's, you know, we're filling in a big gap because so much of the stories about our people were not written by us. And so when I look at your, your artwork and I see the patterns that you've chosen, I know that they're informed by history. Um, I, and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, you know, where did you learn these patterns? Um, what is your research process? And, uh, you know, how, how does that help you as an artist to really kind of look for inspiration in history? Yeah, that's really cool. Oh, thank you for that question, Lola. Um, authenticity, ooh, challenging word, scary word in, in the art world. Uh, but the way you put it is actually how I view what is authenticity. You know, it's all about your intention. 
in, in the process. That is authentic, what your intention is. And having the due diligence of doing research is perform uh, is staying true to what is authentic, you know, and it kind of, uh, you know, it gives a lot of value to this, to the people you're telling stories about that you do the research, you go ask the people the questions. Um, yeah, you struggle, you experience things in the process. That's to me the part of the whole process of authenticity. And in my work as an artist, especially when I do my patterns, um, yeah, I did a lot of research when I was in my undergraduates at University of Guam in the sociology department. The way I've done that was I killed two birds with one stone. All of my papers that I had to write for my sociology classes, I wrote about the sociology of art and the sociology of tattooing um, in, in Micronesia. And I really focused on symbolic interaction, which is one of the theories in sociology. And symbolic interaction really goes by how does a community interact with visual aids, visual things that they see visually or that, or that it's done that makes a profound impact to how people perceive and value things. So that's to me is what symbolic interaction and symbolic interaction in terms of pattern work is that the intentions that the original artisans had for certain patterns and how does that trend and yeah. So like navigation, we a lot of it is seen today. Um, mostly other islands outside of Guam and the Marianas. Um, the dolphin pattern is quite prevalent, especially amongst navigators. And I would see that being tattooed by Phil Sablon today, but it's also been traditionally done um, and seen in a lot of the books. Like some of the folks I utilize as my research for tattooing in Micronesia would be like Lars Krutek, who has a website um, under his name all about tattooing all around Oceania. And he was like the basis of my research, understanding the value of patterns, um, the protocols when we pattern, the protocols after we pattern. Like I, when I get tattoos, I got a tattoo on Monday um, based off the protocols that I've seen in the Marshallese book by, um, I think his last name is Russell. Um, they would go through this whole process of like, you know, um, abstaining from sexual pleasures, um, no alcohol. And like when I got my tattoo, I also participated in those kind of protocols. And when I do my patterning, uh, depending on what I'm patterning for, I will also undergo those protocols of what I have read in my research. And to me, that kind of gives that whole spirit that's needed in our indigenous artwork in our indigenous process and when we think about authenticity in indigenous framework you know it's having a sense of protocols that you depict for yourself that allows you to honor and be responsible for what you create what you're responsible is the people that you bear in your stories and what is responsible is how you want to uphold yourself within the story as well. And yeah, that's why like when I do my storytelling through patterns, I really try my best to um, maintain that, that responsibility for myself and for, and for what my artwork represents. Like even when I paint, I have a certain protocol that I would um, imbue my paint with um, my saliva. And to me, if it's a special piece, like I, I do that. And that's just part of my sense of authenticity. <laughs> um, but yeah. Oh, another part of my research is exposing myself to the stories, exposing myself to hearing it from the people themselves. Like I would be, I was able to utilize this one pattern uh, that represents the house because I was able to travel to Yap 
and I was able to learn the stories behind the patterns from one of the elders. And I was so connected with it. And, you know, it's that form of permission gained um, for my process to utilize the patterns. Like there's some patterns that I've used in the past that I don't use today. Because to me, I have not gained that permission to utilize that story. So there's a Marshallese pattern I really want to use again, but I, I choose not to do that for myself today because I need to go to the Marshall Islands. I want to talk stories with some of the, with, you know, with whoever I'm able to that, you know, would allow me to, you know, in a way, share those stories in my, in my patterns today. So, yeah, that's another aspect of um, my process, my ways of I've informed myself. Um, yeah. Wow, thank you for sharing that. It really comes back to intention. So uh, my question is, um, did your creative process change, say, if you were to create a piece that goes with someone else's story? Like, for example, the legend <laughs> that you illustrated? Um, so the question is, does my creative process differ from what like I'm were, creating for? Yeah. Like if I was creating for, um, a book apart, like with, that's so monumental, um, my creative process is a lot longer. My creative process is a lot more in depth and really, um, like ceremonial in a way, because I want to do good. I want to make sure my piece also amplifies and joins with the other pieces involved um, versus like when people ask me to do stories, their own stories, or like when my family asks me like, hey, can you create a piece for me? It's hard. It's hard if you're living, to tell you the truth. It's hard for me to create a pattern for someone who's living because you know, their stories is still going on versus if they passed away, I can build, I can, there's something there that I'm able to connect with more so that I, it's easier for me to tell that story. Like when my sister passed away last year, um, it took me a while to get, understand what I wanted to say for her, for her piece. Um, it took me like months, months just to try and figure out what was her piece all about. Um, then there's actually some cases where it's just so easy and it clicks. Like when I was commissioned to do a story with um, Bank of Guam, um, it took me a while, but all it took for me was to read one of the first articles that Jesus Leon Guerrero posted in the PDN, asking the community, I'm trying to do this for the people of Guam to create their own bank so that people have a future of investment. And it was that one article that triggered my mind to to see a certain palette of patterns. And that palette of patterns is right here, actually. I do have that. Um, but yeah, give me a second, folks. I appreciate your time. Um, but yeah, so this is the pattern I created for the Bank of Guam. Um, where's that share button? So yeah. So uh, when I read the article at the Bank of Guam office about what Jesus Leongaro was writing uh, with um, the governor at the time, uh, Governor Guerrero, um, yeah, I created this pattern. The people of Bank of Guam also was really want to emphasize the even tree. So way I taste, tell my stories is always looking from the bottom going up, actually. Um, and that's actually a protocol that's also seen in... Um, Yaki's machi, which is a traditional weaving, weaving using coconut, uh, using banana fibers and hibiscus fibers. Um, and it's only done in the outer islands of Yap, not in Yap proper at all. So it's like Yuliti, Satawa, um, Poloat, and such and such. But yeah, so they read it from bottom to top. So in the bottom, it, um, it's a story of the people of Guam and the reason why it's people of Guam rather than ancestors in my in my storytelling is because the head is available, the head is visible. Whereas if it's ancestors, the head will be um, gone. And there's more stories behind that. But as it goes up, 
uh, the people of Guam, um, this institution is on this journey. Now I'm on the zigzags on this journey um, to create a foundation. And the reason why it's, bank, it's the Bank of Guam and the foundation is because what's going in between the laddie stones is this really thick line and we go to the top of the line where you see these triangles intersect thing. Um, that's a tree. That's my pattern for an EBIT tree that in the process of thinking about Bank of Guam, that's what um, transpired. So the tree, the, the canopy of the tree is overshadowing or covering the house. So the Bank of Guam wants to, wants to be an institution that allows people to create homes to have their families, you know, so yeah, Laddie Stones, the house on the Laddie Stones. Then above this whole imagery with the with the Epic tree is these two solid white lines, and in the middle is these intersecting lines. And to me, these intersecting lines is why I always refer to it as community, to build community, the value of community. Um, and in Real in-depth stories. Um, we'll go from a fishing net point of view. Actually, um, each of the line represents a person in the community, and the fishermen would weave their net to catch fish. And um, all the intersecting points is how we, as a community, are able to, you know, work together. And the fishermen will cast their nets, and if we can work together, we will catch the fish. If there is a breakage at one point, the fish will come out. So, you know, if we're not working together, so everything's going to fall apart. The fish are going to run away. So we have to stay together as much as possible. So that's, yeah. <laughs> Storytelling in my, in, in what I do. Thank you for that question, Akina. Thank you for sharing. So I think we have time for one more question. Anyone else want to ask Joey their second question? Okay. Eddie? I just, everyone's got great questions and here I am with my lame question. What advice can you give to up and coming artists? And how does it feel knowing that your art inspires? Because I just have to say, listening to your stories and seeing all these artworks and everything, I'm a meet, I am inspired to like write certain, like from that art earlier, I just, I, I immediately got this spark of like what to do for a certain piece that I have in mind. So yeah, where, where can we go on island um, to seek inspiration if we're, if we're wanting to start this, this journey? Um, I think it's really cool that I really like your question, right? And you know, like I, I, I was a teacher at academy in 2014, 2015. I was a teacher at St. Francis two years ago, and a lot of my classes didn't really wasn't so technical. It was all about channeling our creativity and our imagination, and some of the things I always love to do with my students and now I would love for you to do is really um, really hone into things that are really personal and share great moments with friends, with family members and make it really intentional because in those moments and experiences, you find a lot of profound um, uh, situations, profound moments like when you hang out with your, your Nana your aunties and really hang out with them don't kind of like i'm just going to hang out with you to be cool but really hang out with them and have really um really funny conversations and from those moments you might find amazing stories that you know like oh my goodness i can write about that auntie because you like told me so much in depth about what you're going through what you're feeling and and I would love to tell your story or like you can go out into nature and some of the things that I would do with my friends, some of the friends here on this, on this chat, on this Zoom call is that in terms of connecting with our ancestors, we would go to Laddie sites, but we would clean the Laddie sites. We would acknowledge this, that we're in their space 
and have a moment in solitude. And from there, we were able to channel maybe what could be the thinking of our ancestors and to be able to share it with friends and have a cool conversation can transpire really amazing ways to tell stories about our ancestors or about connecting spiritually. Um, uh, what's another fun way? Uh, or just really talk about amazing symbols profound symbols that you see in your day-to-day -day life that have always reminded you and draw you back to this one concept. And from there, that can lead to something great as well. So again, I think um, my biggest uh, statement would be intention is everything. Everything you do and everything you're gonna do is all about intention. So lead with intention. And that's something I picked up when I went to Bali in 2011. And that's with the University of Wong too. So you're an amazing institution to inspire you more and more after you have this fellowship with the UOG Press. So yeah, Santa Masi. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joey. So where can everyone follow your work and what you do on social? Oh, that's what's up. So um, you can follow me for those who are listening on Facebook. Thank you for joining us with the UOG Press and their amazing fellows. Um, if you want to follow me, you can look me up, uh, Joseph Certeza on Facebook, or if you want to follow my brand, um, Tau Pacific Designs on Facebook, as well as Instagram. Um, yeah, so you'll see all of my cool stuff. A lot of the com the captions I have in my personal stuff, which is like Tau671 on the Instagram, I get more in depth of intentions of why I drew things um so if you guys are interested in more stories then if you go on my top of designs you might have more storytelling on my pattern and more going in depth on certain um um imagery uh, soon after this fellows and those on facebook right those on facebook you guys get to have a chance to win an amazing giveaway that myself and the amazing folks at university press have collaborated with and that is a cool giveaway of the amazing Chamorro Legends book if you don't have, and it's a must have, and what I was able to create for this holiday season, which is uh, taking my Chamorro Legends illustration and put it onto a cool tote bag. Um, something cool about this tote bag, it's not your normal tote bag, it's an extra special tote bag, because when you open it, it has a cool zipper. So if you need to close things, you know, it can zip it all up. And if you have a cell phone, but you don't want to dig all the way down in, or if you have pens that you don't want to dig all the way down in the bag, and who knows, it might get lost, there's a cool little pocket. So this is just not your typical tote bag. It's an amazing tote bag um, brought to you by Top Pacific Design, as well as a collaboration with the University of Pre Press. And to win so, you would, uh, um, yeah you would go on to the Instagram and you are going to tell us a story of, um, oh my goodness, I'm just getting nervous already because of the post part. So um, if you guys are interested in winning the tote bag of the Tomorrow Legends uh, book, you are to go on to the, my Instagram or UOG Press and you are to leave a comment about your favorite memory of an elder your favorite memory of an elder. It could be uh, your own elder in your family, or it could be an elder that you ran to that you had a profound moment with. Um, but yes, that is your way to be um, entered into our giveaway. And we will announce that giveaway on probably Monday morning at 10 a.m. And please Pastor. be sure to tag at UOG Press and at Tau Pacific Designs on Instagram. Yes, so you have to you tag have us to, tag. to enter to the giveaway. So everybody who, who tells the story of an elder will be entered into a raffle, and then we will choose two winners on Monday. So between now and Monday, oh. please share your story and tag either UOG, or no, actually tag both of us if you can, UOG Press and Tau Pacific Designs. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Joy, for you know being here with us and sharing your stories with us. We always love having these creative conversations. And also always for everyone tuning in. Oh. <laughs> Um, and also for everyone tuning in, I hope um, you guys can continue to support our Joyce work and um, our future creative conversations that we'll be hosting here. And on Thursday, December 17th at noon, we will be having a launch for the 19th, 19th issue of Storyboard. And after the launch, Storyboard will be available for sale at the OG Triton Bookstore and at our offices on the second floor of the American Asia Air Research Center from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And then also our retreat application deadline has been extended to January 15. Um, so if you'd like to get away and just spend some time in the beautiful village of Melissa with us, <laughs> um, you can download the application on our website at uog.edu backslash uog press. Right. Is there anything else you want to share before we log off, Joey, or any of the fellows? Uh, I'm very excited to see what kind of amazing artwork, writings that you guys are going to do, especially if you guys join this amazing retreat, which you guys should do. You guys better. It's, to be able to work with these amazing women, I guarantee you that something great for yourself is going to happen. I've, I've, I've experienced amazing stuff working with Lola, and it's been so profound, everything that, and everything I did with Lola, so... I'm guaranteed that you guys will also have that same experience. Too. Lucky you guys. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. So I guess we'll log off now. Adios and until our next creative conversation. Adios.